Hi there and welcome to this video on GCSE biology for the AQA specification focusing on animal tissues, organs and organ systems and in particular focusing on coronary heart disease. I'm Shumana from StudyMind where we help you revise GCSE biology with our helpful video tutorials tailored to your subject, your specification and to you. If you're new here, make sure you click the subscribe button. Whilst you are watching, please leave any comments below if you're unsure about anything and let us know if it's your first time watching our videos so we can send you our free revision materials. We also have helpful timestamps below for each part of the video to help guide you through the specification. So let's get started. Hello and welcome to tutorial four of seven on organs and organ systems and today we're going to be focusing on coronary heart disease. So just to remind you, in the previous session we looked at the structure and function of the four different components of blood, so do go back and watch that before you move on to this tutorial. So as I said, today we'll be looking at coronary heart disease, which is a really, really expanding problem currently, um, not only in the UK but also globally as we're getting more ageing populations, and also as other um, metabolic diseases such as diabetes and obesity are on the rise and we'll also be looking at the treatment of heart failure and also the treatment of faulty valves alongside that. So first of all let's just recap on what the coronary arteries actually are. So the coronary arteries are the blood vessels that supply the heart. So remember coronary basically means associated with the heart. So the coronary arteries are the arteries that are directly associated with supplying the heart. And I think people often forget that the heart needs to be supplied directly by arteries, even though it has so much blood within it, moving through it every second, every minute. Um, that blood that's being pumped through its atria and ventricles is not actually being used by the heart cells um, to gain oxygen and glucose um, because that kind of system is only to move blood around the body. Instead we have a separate set of arteries that are dedicated to supplying our heart muscle and these are the coronary arteries and they actually come straight off the aorta so they're one of the first few branches from the aorta as it leaves the heart to supply the rest of the body from the left ventricle. So Occasionally, fatty deposits can build up inside these arteries. So this can occur anywhere around the body, but it's quite common in the coronary arteries. And so if fatty deposits are building up in the lumen of our heart, can you see how we're getting a narrower space for the blood to move through? So this can become a problem because it means that less oxygen and less glucose is being delivered to the heart muscle. So this is coronary heart disease. So as I said earlier, just remember that the heart muscle needs this blood in order to contract because remember it's a muscular organ, especially the left ventricle, which needs to generate enough pressure to force blood into the aorta and around the rest of the body at high pressure. So the blood that supplies the heart muscle is really, really essential because this is probably one of the most active organs in our body. So how do we treat coronary heart disease? Well, we have multiple options, so we may use stents, statins, or even a heart transplant. So let's go through these one by one. So stents are a mechanical device, and they are used to restore the blood supply to the heart. Because remember, in coronary heart disease, the arteries are partially blo blocked by fatty deposits. And so in order to reverse this, stents, how they work is they reopen these arteries. And this occurs by um, using a wire that you guide into the blocked artery. And this wire may be associated with a balloon, which will then expand and basically fill up or push aside the plaque for, that, that's formed on the artery wall and therefore reopen the coronary artery. So this is how the stent works. So you can see that you have this guide wire that's inserted into the artery and this is this wire mesh is your stent and so once the guide wire has been inserted into the blocked artery we then have a balloon that expands to make the stent fill the lumen of the artery so lumen just means the inner space 
and this expansion therefore will push any plaques flat against the um, artery wall and therefore reopen this lumen of your artery and therefore allow blood flow to be resumed to the heart muscle. So for treatments there's always going to be various associated advantages and disadvantages. So the advantages of stents is that they can be very effective for a long period of time which is really really useful because it means that we don't have to keep doing this invasive procedure because obviously there are risks associated with inserting a wire into a patient's artery. Also, because it's not too much of, inv of an invasive procedure, we're not opening up the patient, um, there's a relatively short recovery time associated with stent treatment. And it's also a really useful option when drugs are not effective. But there are some disadvantages, of course. So surgery may be required for stent insertion. And if obviously there will be a risk of infection during surgery or during the normal stent procedure in itself. And because we're inserting a foreign object into the body, there is a chance of getting a blood clot because, for example, it may disrupt the endothelium lining the artery and therefore cause the platelets to form a blood clot there and that can actually further exacerbate blocking of the artery. So that's your stents. So now let's look on, look, um, on, look at drugs associated with the treatment of coronary heart disease. So these drugs are known as statins and statins work by reducing the amount of low density lipoprotein in the body. So we have two types of cholesterol, high density lipoprotein and low density, and HDLs are very good for you, whereas LDLs increase the amount of fatty deposits forming in the bloodstream. And statins work by affecting an enzyme that synthesises this LDL cholesterol, and therefore they reduce the formation of fatty deposits in the arteries because they reduce the amount of cholesterol in the bloodstream. So similarly to stents, there are advantages and disadvantages associated with statins. So they reduce the amount of LDLs in the bloodstream and therefore they naturally reduce the risk of clot. So that's a big advantage. Another advantage is that they're less invasive than stents. So if you're ever asked to um, talk about the advantages and disadvantages of a certain treatment of any kind of disease, remember you can contrast it to other available treatments. So here we're contrasting it to the stent treatment and we're saying that statins are a drug that are taken orally, so therefore they are less invasive than stents. So that means that they have lots of really good benefits in the sense that they're not, they, they don't form any kind of increased risk of infection for the patient, for example. However, there are disadvantages, so there will be some minor side effects such as muscle pain and headaches, and more major long-term side effects such as liver failure and kidney damage. Also, statins are not suitable for everyone, so for example, pregnant women, women shouldn't be treated with statins. Patients may also have poor adherence, so statins re require taking quite regularly, and so patients may forget, for example. Whereas with a stent, a patient can't forget about it because it's already been inserted and it's kind of there for the long term. And associated to this, statins need to, statins need to be taken continuously. So as I said just now, don't be afraid of contrasting your treatment that you're talking about with various existing treatments because this is a good way of contrasting um, which treatment is best for various patients. So now let's look at our third option for treatment of coronary heart disease, the heart transplant. So let's just quickly recap the anatomy around the heart. So we have the vena cava, which is returning deoxygenated blood from the rest of the body, and that's returning it to the right atrium of the heart. We have the aorta, which is coming out of the left ventricle and pumping blood to the rest of the body. We've got the pulmonary vein, which is bringing oxygenated blood blood back from the lungs into the left atrium and you can see the left atrium just here. So remember this is the right side of the heart, this is the left side of the heart because we're looking at the patient face on. And if you're a little bit confused about this perhaps go back and watch the heart tutorial which was a little earlier on in this lecture series. So sometimes coronary heart disease can be so bad that it can lead to heart failure. 
So basically this can occur when the heart, a section of the heart muscle is not receiving enough oxygen or glucose, therefore it's unable to contract to pump enough blood around the body to meet the demands for oxygen. So this is heart failure. So this is a really severe case of coronary heart disease, and so in this case a severe treatment option will have to be used, which, are, which is in the form of a heart transplant. So where on earth do we get hearts for heart transplants? Well, we have a couple of options, so we can use donor hearts or artificial hearts. So people often donate their heart after death. But suitable hearts are not that common to find because we have to match hearts from one person to the next. So you can't just take a heart from a random person and put it into person B. There are various matching procedures that have to go on in order to reduce the chance of the heart being rejected by the body, which we're going to go on to look at later on in this tutorial. So again, there are, there are advantages and disadvantages associated with this treatment option. So it may be the only solution to heart failure, and it's also less risky and more natural than using an artificial heart, which we're going to come to look at soon. But the disadvantage is that there isn't a surplus of donor hearts out there, and also the risk of immune rejection is quite high, so we will be looking at this in further detail. So an artificial heart can also be used, and this is a man-made device that acts to emulate the function of the natural heart, so therefore it acts to temporarily pump blood in the patient. And this can actually give the heart time to rest or heal, or to help the patient as they wait for a transplant. So it works very similarly to our normal heart. Again, this is the right side, this is the left side and you have your right atrium, your right ventricle, your left atrium and your left ventricle. So blood will be returned to your artificial heart via your vena cava and um, you don't really need to know this but there is a superior and there is an inferior vena cava. So superior vena cava returns deoxygenated blood from your head and neck, so your superior upper part of your body and your inferior vena cava returns blood to your heart from your inferior part of your body, hence inferior vena cava, so that's from your legs, for example. And so this is all being returned into your right atrium, pumped through to your right ventricle and up out by the pulmonary artery to the lungs where it's reoxygenated, and back into the left atrium via the pulmonary vein, which you can't see at, on this aspect, then down into the left ventricle and up and out, that's going to be a big massive pump to generate enough pressure to pump the blood through the aorta and round to the rest of the body. And then it will return via the vena cava again. So it works, it's very clever, it works in exactly the same way as the natural heart. But of course it's man-made, so you do have to take that into consideration. But this has one advantage in that it's less likely to be immunologically rejected. And the disadvantage is that it obviously would require very invasive surgery. So this would carry so many risks, such as infection risk and also thrombosis, so blood clotting and other com complications. So I was talking about immune rejection of any kind of transplant. So this is when your body's immune system senses an object as foreign and therefore acts to defend your, your body against this foreign object. So this can occur in the case of any kind of transplant. So therefore you would want to give immunosuppressants, so you want to suppress your immune system to reduce the chance of your immune system attacking this new heart. So these are drugs which suppress your immune system and therefore reduce this risk of rejection of your transplanted heart. And if there, this can actually lead to a complication because if there is any infection from surgery, this global immunosuppression that's going on in your body as a result of these drugs can actually cause an increased risk for the patient by weakening the body's natural defences. So therefore it will make your patient more susceptible to getting various other infections. So you do have to keep that in mind with a patient taking immunosuppressants. And lastly, we'll come on to look at the treatment of faulty valves. So remember, valves, they ensure that blood flows in one direction. 
And they're really, really important in the heart, but also in veins, so in, in the low pressure system, because we don't want any black backflow of blood because that would be inefficient. So damage to the heart valves can make them more leaky, causing this backflow of blood. And it can also make them more stiff, which may stop the valves opening properly. So when the valves are severely damaged, they should be replaced. And again, we can have a natural valve replacement using biological valves, which may be made from humans or other animals, such as cows or pigs. Or we may use mechanical valves, which require surgery, well, both require surgery, and also carries risks of thrombosis or complication. So let's have a look at the advantages and disadvantages. Well, replacing valves is less invasive than a heart transplant, so therefore carries fewer risks in the sense of um, risk of infection or risk of thrombosis. But the disadvantage is that they may need to be replaced regularly, because imagine your valves are going to be constantly in action as blood flows past them, so they're going to get worn down very easily. So that's all for today. I hope you enjoyed that and I will see you for your next tutorial. Thanks for watching this free video from Study Mind. If you liked this video, make sure to subscribe to catch our newest videos by clicking below and leave a comment on a topic you'd like a video on. Click here to watch more videos in our series for GCSE Biology or visit our website studymind.co.uk for free past paper compilations by topic and specification.